Think Tech Hawaii, civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha everybody, and welcome to the Think Tech Studios. This is another episode of Security Matters Hawaii. I'm your host, Andrew Lanning, the security guy, and I've got Mike Gonzalez in the house today, and we are gonna be talking about defense in depth. This is a security principle that all of you should be familiar with if you're involved in security for your facilities. And Mike, I want to start with one question. First of all, thanks for coming in, brother. Yeah, Appreciate it. Good thanks to see you in the studio. I've been trying to get you in here for years. <laughs> um, what keeps you up at night, man? Keeps me up at night? I think it would be the Internet of Things. Oh. Like that, <laughs> yeah. would, that keeps me up at night. There's a lot of people connecting all kinds of things to the Internet, and they all have questionable security on them for the most part, especially yeah. when they first come out. So, sure. you know, translate that into our realm in the security world, right? You have yeah. all these IP-based devices that are out on the edge of these facilities, fences, on the side of walls, outside of a building, something like that. Uh -huh. All that stuff can be leveraged to sure. break into a company's network and do all kinds of badness, right? And which is ironic because the whole point of it is to stop that kind of thing. But <laughs> that's the that's the stuff that people it's, are going for. It's like we're fighting to secure it and they're fighting to open it up. Yeah, I don't it's understand. It's a constant struggle. So. Wow. So you've been in security a long time, man. Um, yeah. You're a long time practitioner with a lot of skills. So give us, give us, just give us a sense of your, uh, your, uh, your, uh, I guess your, your background as much as you want to tell. Anyway, you don't, give, right. you don't have to give away the farm. Well, I joined the army when I was 17. Awesome. And, uh, I, thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I. Oddly enough, my military service had absolutely nothing to do with what I do these days. <laughs> but it did, it did uh, create a very good, you know. Uh, baseline of, of sure. skills that were useful later, right? So I, uh, I was in the infantry, I, uh, a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom. I got out of the military in 2006 and uh, went to work in security as I was going to college. And, awesome. uh, and one thing led to another and all of a sudden now I'm have a security career. I decided, <laughs> I decided, decided to do that rather than what I was actually going to school for. Isn't so. that interesting how yeah. pe people, so many people in our industry, and we talk about yeah. this a lot, uh, industry-wide, like no one grew up going, I'm going to be mm -hmm. in the security industry. Nobody, mm -hmm. No one knows about our industry until they fall in it. But yeah. once you fall in it, yeah. like protecting lives and property is mm -hmm. kind of, kind of, a lot of responsibility, but it's a it's a good job. It, is, it makes it you feel is. good at the end of the day about it what does. you do, so we don't leave. <laughs> it, it does. Yeah. It becomes a career. Yeah, we kind of get stuck in it because it's it's uh, it. It kind of plays into the same reasons I, you know, I joined the army, right? Yeah. If I'm going to spend my time doing something, I want to spend my time doing something that's useful and Me that it's it's helpful, and I can see the usefulness immediately. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I can see the results yeah. of what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah it's great work. So. so when we start off with security and people say, I got a problem, and we show up, where's the first thing we look? Around the perimeter. Mm -hmm. So defense in depth, we're going to dig into that. Um, we're going to start at the perimeter. And I, I really like to teach my team, and I'm also military background. That's what the military does. You know, we have fence lines, and we have guards on the fence lines and gates, and we, mm -hmm. the military can really afford to extend its security on out to that perimeter where a lot mm -hmm. of commercial security doesn't get that and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, I like my team from the commercial space to actually even cruise around the neighborhood, you know, the adjoining streets, you know, how far away is the police station, how far away is the fire station. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, what other type of businesses are operating in that area? Are they open 24 seven or are mm -hmm. they closed? Are there any adjacent buildings? Are there any abandoned buildings? Those mm -hmm. can be a nest of Absolutely. problems. So, you know, once you get a feel for the sort of environment the place is in, now you're at the fence line. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's your experience with fence lines, man? I mean, you walk, so, some don't exist, by the way. Don't even, yeah, people don't even put don't. up a fence. They just yeah. invite you right on the property. Come on in. Uh, fence lines, in my experience, uh, are kind of like a speed bump in a parking lot. If, ah. <laughs> uh, if you want to get over it or through it, you're going to get through it. Sure. And I've seen videos uh, of my properties at my workplace, uh, people getting over an eight-foot fence with triple-strand barbed wire on the top in less than 10 seconds. Sure. Yeah, you know I mean, no Just problem. Throw the carpet over. Yeah. And, yeah. So, like, I've seen the SEAL teams. I think they yeah. take about two seconds, those guys. So d depending on what you're trying to do, you sure. know, the fence lines are, an imp fences and barbed wire and things of that nature are an important part of defense in depth, but they are not the end all be all when it comes to security, right? I mean, it's yeah. just, it's something that you should do, but it's not where you stop. Right? Yeah, I like so. the speed bump idea too, because at least we're starting to buy some time, you know, yeah. and at the perimeter, you know, we're really trying to set up our, our 
first level of detection, which starts our clock count for our response. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we have seen some folks laying, um, you know, we've had leaky coax, we've had in induction type systems, fiber in the ground. Mm -hmm. So we can get outside of that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, seen some of that with some video, folks trying to work, you know, on the outside. Video has been a, a sort of a problematic issue for our industry over the years. We've gotten mm -hmm. better. Um, what, are, what other kind of things do you see um, kind of just outside the fence line? Have you, have you had any experience with maybe radar or some of these other newer technologies that have, you know, become you know, a little more uh, uh, palatable to the commercial space. Absolutely. When you're looking at perimeter defenses, you want to look at something that's going to do what you need it to do consistently, and it's going to work on the day you need it to work, right? And also taking into account like the total cost of ownership of that particular system, right? Okay. You, building a, building out a system where you fully understand how much it's going to cost to keep it alive, and, and you're committed to that, and it's part of your your, your overall strategy, mm -hmm. right? Maintenance, so, sure. Maintenance. Fund to maintenance, people. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a big one. So. Um, there are all kinds of things you can do out on the perimeter. Uh, you can have a, whether you have a fence or not, you can do these things. You mm -hmm. can have uh, buried buried sensors that mm -hmm. uh, are in the ground. They're wireless. I've seen that uh, that can detect footsteps. They can detect gunfire, nice. vehicle traffic. Uh, you can integrate those with camera systems, where when it detects that traffic, a camera in the nearby vicinity can mm -hmm. take a look nice. and, and appear automatically in, a, in an operation center, for example. Okay. There's things like uh, ground tracking radars that, uh, and they're becoming very inexpensive these days. Mm -hmm. I know uh, Axis just came out with one. Um, uh, there is quite a few on the market right mm -hmm. now that are in like the you know 50 to 100 meter kind of range. Mm -hmm. And what that's so going short, to do. Short throw radar. Very short throw, yeah. yeah so with geolocation. Sure. So, yeah. so short throw radar is actually, once we pick it up, it, it gives the exact GPS coordinates Absolutely. to the camera. So the camera, bam, is right on the target. And it's pretty smart because you can program that device's exact GPS coordinate while also integrating camera systems programming their GPS coordinates and mm -hmm. they have handoff ability. Yeah, so when, awesome? there's a, when there's a detection that, uh, that cameras need to see, it will determine which camera is closest and which camera can see it uh, mm -hmm. based, based on any programming that you've done. Awesome. And, and it appears. So it's, uh, it kind of looks like magic to the, to the non-tech <laughs> people. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like I'll, I see so. a sensor, boom. I'll, I'll, and then your operator, yeah. all he gets is the image because mm -hmm. he needs to decide quickly what's the response. Guys mm -hmm. with guns, you don't want to send guys without guns. That's a good point. You know, and uh, so yeah. So and or is it a a goat or or, or mm -hmm. in Hawaii we don't have too many mammals, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not mm -hmm. we don't have. I guess we have some deer on some of the outer islands, mm -hmm. but here it's pig. It's usually a pig or a dog. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because gunfire detection is also very important when sure. we're talking about perimeter defenses, right? Uh, depending on what your venue is, you know, what kind of facility it is, and what you're concerned about. I mean, gunfire detection might be something you want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, th those things you can do. Uh, there's audio analytics that can listen for. Gun fire. There's sure. also uh, there's also a form of video analytic that can pick up the muzzle flashes out in the out mm -hmm. in the distance. Uh, there's even sensors that can detect the pressure change of the of the round coming out of the barrel within a certain distance and, nice. and catch that. There's also indoor gunfire detection systems that I've seen that are really great. There's mm -hmm. this. Uh, there's this uh, product from Amberbox that I saw recently that uh, that is a indoor gunfire detection system mm -hmm. for you know other. Layers of your of your perimeter within you know your building. Sure. And, um, so that, you can quickly locate where a shooter may be if you yes. got big wings or like a mall or. And it's know, tied directly really in with the police department. So when it mm -hmm. goes off, uh, it's already rolling a police response because the false alarm rate is zero. Mm -hmm. So we can be assured that when it goes off, it's for. Real. It's actually a gun. Yeah. yeah not a yeah, not a so. cap. Not a, a car backfiring. Yeah. Not a. And the audio audio analytics are what you mentioned are really interesting because I know we've deployed um, out of like an intercom. So you have an, a device there that's already listening, mm -hmm. and they've taken some of those and built in analytics that can detect like gunfire so mm -hmm. and, and gunshot you can hear from far away so not even when they're not maybe on your property if there's a gun sh fight nearby perhaps there could be damage to your facility from stray bullets maybe mm -hmm. it's pe gangsters shooting each other yeah, well they yeah. might damage your equipment that's and a good point you need to know that that's going on you know, getting back to your point about uh, going around the neighborhoods and looking at mm -hmm. for abandoned buildings where the closest police department fire stations are that's also that's very important when you're doing like an assessment of a facility before you go out and build out any defense in depth or anything like that mm -hmm. Is, is understanding what you're working with, right? And if those 
issues are a problem in the neighborhood you're working in if there's if there's gang activity or, or gunfire happens you know even if it's just hunting or something like that and it's something you want to be aware of or just vandalism mm -hmm. those are all things that you can identify in an assessment process and getting back to your point about sending the right person for the job that's why gunfire detection is very important because you don't want to send a technician or a guy with a hard hat out to solve a problem that should be sending <laughs> yeah. a guy with a gun yeah. right? when, when you need the police yeah so or SWAT or that, whatever it may be yeah, sure. getting that context is crucial because yeah. you know you're, you're saving lives by doing this yeah it's an interesting a lot of people don't think that detectors you know they they give us a they let us know something's happening mm -hmm. and we then we try to use the camera to maybe get some remote visibility mm -hmm. so we can figure out how to respond and you know if you if you don't have full awareness for example if you zoom in very rapidly on one guy you can see wow he's not armed but if you don't have the larger picture the other three guys at the fence line are armed yeah. <laughs> yeah, or something exactly. like, they yeah. threw their buddy over you know whatever understanding that context yeah, yeah that so. context is super critical for the response so we, we've took a little bit outside the perimeter once they hit the fence um, what kind of effective things have you seen that work like on so you can kind of tell you know wow I tripped mm -hmm. a signal while well, now boom I got a fence signal someone's on my fence that's mm -hmm. a that's a little different animal yeah it is and there's quite a few solutions out there that can do something like that there's a uh, there's fiber that you can put in the mm -hmm. fence that uh, there's there's controllers that go around the fence line that shoots that light through the fiber and it can detect even the slightest change of how quickly it takes that light to get from one side to the other based on the deflection of somebody touching mm -hmm. a fence. So when they jump on it and it bends exactly. the fence, boom. Yeah, it bends alarm. the fiber just slightly and mm -hmm. then there's an alarm. You can do cut, climb, or any kind of tamper. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those are integratable with camera systems too. And why I keep getting back to that is that when we talk about perimeter security and, and things of that nature, it's important to also have some sort of video surveillance in there, especially if you're doing a remote security operation. Oh, yeah. Because you're going to have false alarms. Things that things happen. Like, for example, all of these different intrusion detection technologies out of the perimeter, they all have their own inherent weaknesses, right? Mm -hmm. There are things that can set them off uh, as a false alarm. For sure. example, some of the some of the fence detectors that you see out there, they have algorithms in there that say, don't go off the first time something touches the fence. Wait till the third time because uh -huh. uh, okay. that's going to cut down significantly on false alarms. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how many times a day I've seen at some of the facilities that I work with where birds land on the wire in quick succession, <laughs> and then boom, that that algorithm is useless. Yeah, because it's a flop. So, yeah, it's a flop. <laughs> yeah, so so that sort of thing is important to have video. Mm -hmm technology in place also so we can immediately see and understand that context and disregard that alarm and not get into the habit of just shutting it off because that's what we think it always is. You know, that never goes well for, for people who have that sort of <laughs> alarm fatigue, right, or uh, sure. in, in any control center that, that uh, taking care of false alarms is crucial if you want to make sure that your people are on it the day that you need them to be on it. Yeah, that's a, that's a real important thing, especially for perimeter, because perimeter in its nature is large. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a, a, which we, that's why we see a lot of people will sort of surrender the perimeter. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to take a break in a little bit, but we'll, and so we'll get inside the perimeter after this. But that, that issue of, of perimeter extension, you know, and, and remember, it's super valuable because as further I, I can push detection, the more time I have to respond. Absolutely. And so that is depending on the asset, and, and you brought a really great point about getting your assessment done properly, understanding what the risks are if you can't respond by the time they reach the more important assets on the inside or whatever it may mm -hmm, be. Mm -hmm. That is a critical component to de even developing and deciding what type of perimeter security you might need to deploy. Mm -hmm. What kind of false alarm rate could you live with, which is actually should be about zero, but mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. you definitely want the capacity to you know, have another type of technology confirm for you what it is your sensor has detected. Right. Um, I've definitely seen good-sized pigs that could be the size of a small guy oh, crawling yeah. and things like that. Oh, so yeah. it's it the camera helps you really take a look and, and verify that. So that you're mm -hmm. sort of responding to a verified alarm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, tell you what we're going to do. Let's take a short break. Uh, we're going to go pay some bills because, you know, this is such a well-funded organization. And we will uh, be back in a minute and we'll get inside the perimeter. Okay. Hey, hey, baby, that's you. I want to know, will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock and it's out of the comfort zone and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. 
Hi, my name is Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review, coming to you from Honolulu, Hawaii, right here in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Asian Review is the oldest of the 35 or so shows um, uh, broadcast by Think Tech Hawaii. We've been in production since 2009. Our goal is to provide you, the viewer, with information, breaking information about events in Asia. Asia being anything from Hawaii west to Pakistan, from the Russian uh, Far East, south to Australia and New Zealand. We hope to see you every Monday afternoon at 5 p.m. Hey, welcome back to the Think Tech Studio. I'm Andrew, the security guy. This is Security Matters. We're talking with Mike Gonzalez, and we're talking about defense in depth. Now, we've been talking a little bit about perimeter. The final thing I think we wanted to mention was a little bit of sort of dual factor uh, mm -hmm. detection out there on the perimeter. So what have you seen in that? Because this is a little newer uh, to the industry, but mm -hmm. what, have you, what have you played with there? Well, there's experience? things on the fence that you, that can set off false alarms in addition to wildlife, right? The, building in the, the sway of the fence. The, mm -hmm. Before you the put any sensors on, you want to make sure that it's not swaying. <laughs> and if it is, you want to make sure that your, your, your sensor is uh, adjustable to where sure. you can build that in. Uh, I've seen, because that's an obvious problem, especially with people who have hundreds and hundreds of facilities that these, all these systems are all out at. I've seen new systems being developed that have a traditional intrusion detection system like I mentioned, but it also has a built-in uh, passive infrared sensor on every single one of those uh, uh, sensors along the fence. Uh -huh. And what it's doing is it's not only feeling for cut, climb, and tamper, it's looking uh, directly on the other side of the fence line for about three or four feet uh, mm. looking for motion. So if okay. it doesn't detect motion on the outside of the fence directly across from where that, the sensor that's going off, mm -hmm. it's not going to set off. So it's like a dual technology exactly. type of thing. And it's also, if it's IR, it's looking for heat as well, exactly. right? So exactly. could could be that some birds land while an animal's standing there, mm -hmm. but by and large, you're still going to get a yeah. lot less falsing, which is exactly. an industry, it's a really um, one of those things that the, you know, the residential alarm industry struggle with. Perimeter has always been, especially if you can think about large facilities or, or you know, centered around maybe critical infrastructure, like a, think about a refinery. Some refineries are just square miles. Yes, yes, and absolutely. so, you know, if you have 20 miles of fence on military bases are the same way, mm -hmm. very difficult to cover all of that, um, especially even a guard force is sort of in cable. They're, they're left to just responding. Mm -hmm. I think we're all praying for the day we can just dispatch a drone real quick to take a look, <laughs> you know, on those big <laughs> facilities. And someday I think the, the yeah, FAA that's, might allow that. That's in the works. We're a little ways out. That's in the works. Um, so once you get, let's talk a little bit about getting people through the perimeter. So we, we have, you know, service workers. We have uh, on-site staff. We have a lot of people that actually need to get into the facility to do something. Mm -hmm. um, typically, we're going to see some sort of access control out there, mm -hmm. um, maybe single factor, maybe multi-factor. Um, what do you what do you like to know about your people when they're going? Do you like them scheduled, unscheduled? Talk about that a little bit, you know, about those arrivals at your gate. It really just depends on how, through the course of that threat and vulnerability assessment that we mm -hmm. talked about earlier, is deciding what that facility does, how important it is to you, okay. and what's your business continuity plan, for example, if that facility is Blows compromised <laughs> or something like that, right? So those are all important things to understand before you develop any kind of access control scheme, right, okay. is, the, is to understand how your facility works on a, on a normal basis and try to design something around that, you know, okay. so it doesn't disrupt your entire business. So you can do things like uh, on the, try to avoid, I like to try to avoid anyway, uh, key control problems. Sure. You know, every time somebody leaves the company or leaves the organization or loses a key, for example, especially if that key has a key ring with uh, the address of the building on it, for example. <laughs> oh, ouch. You know what I mean? That yeah. happens a lot. So card readers are an important function you know, for access control. Uh, there's quite a few different kinds of card readers. There's very simple ones that are just key fobs that don't do anything really. You, most people will be familiar with them for their condos to get out of the parking lot, something, mm -hmm. something like that. The exact same technology can be applied to, to an actual ID card. And it's important for any organization to have ID cards for their personnel on their property because mm. that's the quickest way for a security personnel to understand who belongs and who doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. And that applies to visitors as well. Sure. You know, badging visitors and they're walking in with a visitor's badge making it clear that they've passed their security before they ended up wherever you see them in your, in your, in your facility later. Right. So card readers, uh, cards can be lost too, right? Cards... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, ID cards can be lost, access cards can be lost, and somebody could pick it up and it has your company's name on it probably, right? So if that's a concern and, and that's a concern you can't live with, then you can go to dual factor authentication for, mm. for card reader technology. And what that does, there's quite a few different kinds, right? There's a, 
You can scan your card and type in a PIN, for example, and, and that keeps anybody from picking up your you card. Know, right? yeah. so, so it's known only to you. Yep, yeah, only to you. Or uh, what I like about those also is that if you're under duress for those dual factor ones, you can swipe your card and maybe type in your PIN backwards or add a nine at the end or something mm -hmm. like that, and it can alert the security center and pull up the cameras, and yeah. everybody so, knows that you're being forced through this door. And for our audience who may not understand what duress is, perhaps someone's coerced you, has a, a perhaps a, a gun to your head, or has kidnapped some, uh, someone in your family, and the, all these things have occurred, mm -hmm. um, and is forcing you to access the facility. So what you would, can do in the instance that Mike's talking about is present your card and then when you go to put in your code, let's just say for example, I hope it never is, your code's 1234, you could put in 4321 or you could put in 1235. And what that does is it's going to allow you in, everything looks normal to the guy who's watching you who has you under duress, but the, it's going to alert the center that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what duress alarm, that's quite a bit different from the other types of alarms we talk about. Right, right. Thanks for that. So then there's, uh, there's also uh, things like biometrics, right? There's a uh, thumbprints or fingerprint readers that, mm -hmm. that have cards with uh, card swipe. There's also facial recognition, which I use pretty extensively, and awesome. I like that a lot. Uh, they walk up and they scan their badge, and by the time they scan their badge, the reader has already seen their face and compared it against their enrollment picture, and they're all good. They mm -hmm. walk right in, and it's And it updates, it updates the, then it takes the newest picture also, mm -hmm. right? It goes mm -hmm. and takes that and, and updates it. So you, yeah. as you're changing, you know, my, uh, sometimes I have a goatee, sometimes yeah. a beard, you know. Yeah. Sometimes I have hair. No, I don't have hair. <laughs> <laughs> We've had people, like, uh, a lot of people at my company, they have fun trying to fool it. And oh, yeah? I, yeah good. It's fun to watch, How do they do? it's unlikely. Uh, you know, awesome. Um, they try to wear a mask. It's like, no, that's not yeah. That's not going to work. Yeah, it's just, they wear a mask like you. No, that's not Mike. Sorry. Yeah, the way the technology works is it's taking hundreds and hundreds of measurements of your face, right? Sure. Like how far your eyes are apart, how wide your mouth is, where your ears are located, all that stuff. And that's all stuff that's pretty much impossible to fake, to right? Fake. So yeah, I, I love I love the biometric. You know, we have facilities that use all three that, uh, that you've mentioned mm -hmm. so far. You know, something you have, which is your credential, something you know, which is your PIN, and then something that you are. Uh, which is your biometric and oftentimes we see facilities you know that slows people down so it's a little inconvenient to do them all all the time but yeah. perhaps during the work day we're only asking for one uh, maybe as you get closer to an asset like the data center we may ask for two mm -hmm. but after hours you know after from yeah. four from 4 p.m. until 8 a.m. the next morning you're going to use all three if you're mm -hmm. here so and that I, kind of an idea that kind of programming scheme is important right because you, you have various people within your company or within your organization that do different jobs right mm -hmm. some of them have 24 hour jobs, some of them don't. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are contractors, maybe temp workers, that sort of thing, and you want to give them varying levels of access depending on what, they, what their job mm -hmm. is. One of the mistakes that I see a lot of people make when they put access control systems in place is they don't want to deal with the management of it. Yes. So they just give everybody access to everything on the system, and whether it's two, whether it's Ouch. dual factor or not, right? Yes. And that gets into the realm of insider threat, right? When we talk Big about time. perimeter defense, we're thinking keep the bad guys out of our facilities. But what about the wolf in sheep clothing kind That's of guy, right? right? So. That's the kind of situation where you want to segment your your access control system to where it's based on on roles, what your role is in the organization, uh, and that's something that is done at a very high level. You know, yes. with, with between the security department and the leadership of the organization is to decide what are all these roles in the company, what do these roles require access to, and how can we create a scheme that whenever there's a change of personnel status, you change roles or whatever, we can immediately match that in the security mm -hmm. system. And that does a lot of things. It keeps people from wandering into the data center, for example, and throwing, <laughs> throwing in a, a USB stick yeah. into, a, into a server, oh. Oh. and now all of a sudden you're, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're uh, got a lock on, all, you got encryption on all your stuff. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And you got a, it's ransomware, for example. Sure, that's a bad one. Or uh, let's say, for example, uh, um, just the like just regular theft, right? Like theft of of mm -hmm. of pieces of equipment or, or information or, information or sure. whatever, right? So these are all things to be aware of. Obviously, we trust the people that we work with. We need to. You know, we're all on the same team. But it's really not about that. It's about it's about being proactive and prudent and, and taking an all-hazards approach, right, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, to security. Sure. Like we're looking on the outside, but we're also looking on the inside. Because if you have a strategy that stops at your perimeter and you assume everybody from your perimeter inward is trusted, trusted. and welcome, mm. it's gonna be a problem. It's risky, yeah. I like yeah. the I like the least sort of the, the the least amount of authority that is needed for them to do their job. You know, mm -hmm. you may have employees who 
perhaps because of the way that they work or their criticality, they'll require 24-hour access. Mm -hmm. But boy, I hope that's very few people in, a, mm -hmm. in an organization. And then, obviously, subcontractors. You may have some trusted subcontractors. You know, we're cleared contractors for DOD, for example. So some places we're allowed to go without escorts. Still, mm -hmm. there are other places where we... We're always going to be mm -hmm. escorted. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking there's. I don't go to these places, but I'm sure there's nuclear facilities on the mainland that there's yeah. two or three people escorting every person just to make yeah. sure nobody goes crazy. You got to do a background uh, check every five hundred. Yeah. Every, <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's that piece, and then the you know, but the um, the layering out of your staff, right? Because the ability to detect um, just at someone trying to go somewhere where they're not authorized to go. Mm -hmm. Now maybe that's negligent. Mm -hmm. Maybe they oh forgot or, or oh it, they knew it ended at four and it's four ten and they weren't paying attention. Mm -hmm. But those are the kind of things that we all need to know as managers mm -hmm. of our facility and pushing that that incident out to the perimeter helps us gain some time to talk to that person and see what's going on so I'm glad great you mentioned great that. points there's uh, to that to that point there is that uh, identifying risky behavior is mm -hmm. important as you said for security managers but it's also critically important for security managers to talk to their IT people or their mm -hmm. IT security people and understand who's uh, having those risky behaviors on the cyber side as well, going to questionable websites, opening oh, up questionable yeah, attachments, because sure. those those kind of behaviors are, all lead to the same sort of problems, mm -hmm. right? And to identify those kind of people and, and take them aside and give them a little bit of training, 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 kind of training, talk training, to them, training. try to understand, <laughs> they get them to understand why this is problematic, right? Mm -hmm. But the uh, getting back to segmentation of the access control system, it also gets back to uh, things like uh, active shooter prevention, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, Having having nobody except maybe the security people and the president of the company, for example, those are the only people that can move freely throughout the facility and scan everywhere, and mm -hmm. everybody else is segmented. That could drastically reduce your risk for that sort of thing. Sure. Uh, combined with physical barriers and, and ways to reinforce doors and things like that. Mm -hmm. right? So those, awesome. those are all things to think about when when you're building this out. Yeah. That. Um, so the other point you brought that I thought we really didn't mention was of the wearing of the badge. So what what happens is we gain some perimeter assurance. If if I'm just outside in the parking lot and I see that you know someone's out there and they have the badge on and I know I gives me some comfort that they belong there. Mm -hmm. You know, humans are sort of detectors for visual things. And so the wearing of a badge, because a lot of people, for some reason, they don't like it or they leave it white. I think it's a great thing to push awareness outside the building for people who are walking around. It gives away for me to understand that they belong there. Now, maybe they took it off the ground or whatever. It should be reported. Mm -hmm. But um, at least I've got some way of knowing that these people have been, are, are authorized on the facility. And they may be inside my fence line. Maybe the parking lot's outside the fence line. Mm -hmm. um, um, this is amazing. We got through perimeter and we've run out of time. All right. So what I'm going to have to do is get you back in here. And I know you're a busy guy. It may be a while, but I promise we'll get Mike back in for some more defense in depth. Really appreciate you sharing Thank your you knowledge with us today and your Thanks experience. Um, we're going to be at uh, the Pacific Club next Tuesday for Symposium for a Safer Hawaii. Join us there if you want another dose of security. And we'll be back here next Friday on uh, Security Matters. So thanks for joining us on the Think Tech Studios, uh, Think Tech Hawaii Studio. We'll see you soon. Be safe because security matters.